the previous video, we saw how we combine the first and second law of thermodynamics to get a relationship between the change in entropy, the change in volume and the change in internal energy. So, in this video, we are going to use that to estimate the change in entropy of incompressible solids and liquids and we will find that it is a rather simple and elegant expression that we get at the end. So, uh, let us begin. So, uh, what we had was we had uh, TDS uh, is equal to du uh, plus P times dV uh, for closed uh, systems with uh, pure substances, right? And uh, so uh, we can also write this in specific terms as T d s equals d u plus p d v where v is a specific volume this being the total volume and uh, so this is one way of writing it the other way of writing it is to write t d s uh, equals d u plus i'm going to add a term here uh, v d p uh, plus p d v minus v d p so uh, this term has been added and subtracted, so that is fine. And we know that this is VDP plus PDV, so this must be D of PV, right? And you have D of U plus D of PV, so I can write this as D of U plus PV uh, minus VDP, and so this I can write as DH minus VDP, right? Uh, so uh, different ways of expressing the same equation that we had from before. Um, so, uh, in this video, as I said, we are going to look at incompressible solids or liquids. And our definition, remember that by incompressible, we do not really mean incompressible. What we mean is that the change in specific volume is so small that it can be neglected and practically we can assume that uh, the specific volume of these solids and liquids are independent of the pressure. Uh, they may depend on temperature of course, but they are independent of pressure, right? So, uh, re recall uh, from our earlier definition of specific heat and our discussion about specific heats of incompressible solids and liquids that because of their nature of incompressibility, uh, the specific heats at constant temperature and uh, constant, sorry, the specific heat at constant pressure and those at constant volume are equal and they each are equal to uh, just uh, C, which is we just call it specific heat without being specific as to whether it is at constant volume or at constant pressure. Um, so, these are not exactly equal, but these are approximately equal and so uh, we uh, take advantage of the fact that they are not very different. And uh, then we also said that this C is a function of temperature mainly and not so much a function of pressure, right? And so the specific heats of incompressible solids and liquids can be thought of as functions of temperature basically, right? And uh, going back uh, to this equation here um, in which uh, if we take this for an incompressible uh, solid or a liquid, uh, we know that the change in specific volume goes to 0 because this is incompressible. And so, I can write this as just two terms Tds equals du or uh, it can also be written as ds equals 1 by T d, right? And um, so, here um, we also recall that by definition, we have uh, C equals dou U by dou T at constant volume. And uh, we know that for incompressible solids and liquids, uh, we can write this as du dt. And because we can do that, uh, we can write uh, du as C dt. Um, this uh, is a general definition of the specific heat at constant volume. 
This is specifically written for incompressible liquids and solids because C is only a function of temperature. And because we can write this, uh, we can always send the dt to the other side and write du as being equal to C times dt, right? And once I can do that, uh, I can substitute this du equals C dt into this equation here. And I can write uh, TDS equals uh, C dt. And uh, rearranging the terms, I can write uh, equals C times dt over t, right? So now I have the, uh, the differential change in entropy being equal to the specific heat times uh, the differential change in temperature divided by the thermodynamic temperature of the system, right? And so to do, to get delta S, I will need to integrate this uh, as C dt over t. And uh, so uh, if I could integrate this um, here C by T over uh, times dt, I'll get uh, the change in entropy delta S of the system. Uh, as a special case, if C is a constant um, or if it's a very, if it has a very weak dependence on temperature, I can basically take the average uh, between the two temperatures and assume that's the average and it remains more or less constant. So either way, either uh, whether it is constant or whether it has a very weak dependence on temperature, I can pull that out of the integral and write this as delta S equals C times integral dt over t. And uh, it turns out this is an integral that we know how to evaluate. And so we can write this as C times log uh, of the final temperature my, uh, divided by the low, uh, initial temperature. So that's uh, delta S, right? So the delta S for an incompressible solid or a liquid undergoing a process uh, is just C, which is the constant specific heat times the log of T2 over T1. Uh, remember, I can do this only if I'm able to pull C out of the integral. Many times I'm not able to pull C out of the integral. And so I cannot do that. I have to leave it here, but if I can pull it out of the integral, then I can simplify it to an expression like this. Um, so that's the important thing to remember that it's not always that we can pull this out of the integral. And especially if the temperature ranges are large, then C tends to be varying quite a bit and we cannot pull, pull it out of the integral. But in many cases, if the temperature change is only 50, 100 degrees Celsius, 100 Kelvin, um, one could reasonably assume that the C remains constant and pull it out of the integral only for incompressible liquids and solids, not for any substance, but only for these, right? In which case I can then use this equation. Um, so uh, for me to use this equation, I need to be able to justify uh, taking C out of this integral. For me to be able to use this, I need to be able to justify an incompressible substance. And as long as I can do that, I'm able to use this further an incompressible substance with a constant specific heat where this can be pulled out, then I can use this, right? So uh, let's look at what happens to an incompressible liquid or a solid in an isentropic process. And uh, we recall that an isentropic process is essentially a process that is reversible adiabatic. So this is reversible plus adiabatic. And so taking this equation here and uh, this results because this is an isentropic process, delta S equals zero. So then C log T2 over T1 and has to be equal to zero. Uh, this certainly is not zero. None of these are zeros. And so this turns out that T1 equals T2. So uh, for an incompressible solid or a liquid, uh, it so happens that an isentropic process is also a reversible adiabatic process as it is for any substance, but it is also an isothermal process. And that once I increase the temperature of a incompressible solid or liquid, 
I necessarily have to change its entropy and that if I want to retain the entropy or not change its entropy, I have to ensure that the temperature does not change either. And so what this turns out is that an isentropic process for an incompressible solid or a liquid is also an isothermal process and as we know it is also an iso, it is also a reversible adiabatic process. So in here we looked at incompressible solids and liquids. In the next video, we will look at what happens to changes in entropy when you have an ideal gas. Mm -hmm.